Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to see you again today. And hopefully, I'm talking to some of you who were able to be a guest on Easter on site at one of our three locations in the United States or in the one in the Philippines. And you're back. You're here again. And we're so glad to have you. We want to welcome you again. We want you to plug into the church and find out more and be a part of this community. And did you all have a great April Fool's Day. Mm, April Fool's. Yeah. You celebrated, right? I got in no trouble that I can recall. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I've been foolish on many levels, but I have something interesting to tell you oh, about no. April 1st. Here it comes. You thought it was April Fool's Day. It's actually National Atheist Day. April Fool's Day is actually... Interesting. They it, put that together, right? Oh, so yeah. the story goes, in 2003, a man contacted the ACLU and petitioned because atheists didn't have their own day. Mm, mm. He was, mm, he really needed that. Okay. Yeah. So here we are. We now have Atheist Day. Is that a, a real thing? No. no. <laughs> internet hoax. Sorry, y'all. But I thought it went really well together. It's uh, on the internet. April it must Fool's be true. Day and yeah. National Atheist. I thought that was really, really good. That is a good correlation. It is. Okay. So we are here and we are in the third part of our series, Armed and Dangerous. And we're going to talk today about big mission, big provision. What is up with that? You know, if you are if you are new to Rockfish or you're just um, joining us, this is the third in a three-part series that began with Answering the Atheist. Now we're talking about Empowered to Prevail. So in this context, we're going to be looking at the idea of big mission, big provision. And I would ask a question to kind of explain it. Have you ever been asked to do something that you felt woefully unprepared to do? <laughs> that, is, that is a question that's almost rhetorical, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Hey, you know, I think we all have. We have a saying here at Rockfish when it comes to our volunteers that we say a prepared, well-trained volunteer is a happy, productive volunteer. And I think God kind of looks at that the same way. It's his desire that we would be prepared that he and he has provided some incredible provision for an incredible mission that we're on. And uh, that's what we want to deep dive into. Ooh, well, let's not go any further so people can really get all the goods from the message. If you are joining us and admit February and March. Remember, it is right out there on YouTube mm. as content that you can consume. So of course, you're going to want to go back and check those out. Yeah. Like, subscribe, follow. We want to know you're here. So if you're in online community, would you go ahead in the chat below and say, hey, we're here today and we're glad to see you. Yeah. yeah. It, and there are people online right now who are going to remain online to interact with you. There's prayer available. Good time, like Claudia said, to share this and to send it to other folks. Uh, where, where can they find these previous this previous episodes of this series? Well, there is um, YouTube content, I think is the easiest one to okay. look for. I think it's a little harder to find it on Facebook. So you can find previous videos. And if you have the Rockfish Church app. Oh, whoa. the app. You have an app? It's, yes. Oh, my goodness. It's so much easier to find it through that. It really is. So if you have not downloaded the Rockfish Church app, please download that app. And you'll love it. I promise. Yeah. I use it every Sunday to go to the take notes section. Just saying. Yeah. All right. Y'all, we'll see you again next week. Enjoy the worship and the message.
Good morning, Rockfish Church. My name is Ken. It is my honor and privilege to offer a water baptism today. Today I'm wearing a shirt that says, It is finished, in honor of our Lord's resurrection last week. The Greek word is tetelestai, which means simply, it is finished. But it doesn't only annotate that Christ finished his work here on earth. It's also like a contract between Jesus the Son and God the Father that he did the work on our behalf. And even one more context to it. It's a military victory because Jesus went from the cross to Hades to snatch the keys over death. So he did that on our behalf. So those of you who have not yet accepted Christ, I implore you, please consider, he's paved the way. He has paved the way for us. And also those that have not yet confirmed through water baptism, now is your opportunity to make that testament. I believe what Christ has done, he paid for my sins. So please come forth. To my left, your right, fine team over here. They're ready to talk with you, have that conversation and get you ready. So worship team, let's continue to worship. Of the undefeated. 
Man, these are some awesome miracles that we're celebrating today, right? Being born again, the most incredible miracle, the most incredible gift. When a person says yes to Jesus, yields all that they are to to Jesus, and he fills them with the power of their spirit to change them forever. Listen, you may be seated. Today is Celebration Sunday. We're going to celebrate what makes that possible. We're going to celebrate what makes Christianity different than, than anything else out there. And it is the presence of God in the life of the believer made possible by the sacrifice of the Son on behalf of humanity. And we're going to celebrate that together. Listen, if you are a member of the body of, church, uh, body of Christ, you are welcome to participate in communion. We're just going to ask a couple of things. If you're not a believer, I would strongly advise against partaking of the communion. Please don't give it to your children just so they can have something to do. They really need to understand the Bible is very explicit on that. Number two, please hold on to that, and we want to take it together. And number three, this is huge. Does anybody owe you anything? We owed a debt we could never pay, and Christ relinquished that debt. He paid that debt for us. I'm going to ask you, if somebody owes you something today, and I'm not talking about money, I'm not talking about that, but if somebody needs your mercy because of the great mercy that he's given to us would you right now for the sake of a clear conscience give them that mercy and release them to god just for conscience sake the bible says search your hearts as as you begin to take communion as we say yes thank you jesus let us also model what he did to others i think that'll be pleasing to the father's heart Hold that communion again. Has anybody not received the communion who wished to receive it? I know it's still going out. If you've been missed, please. If you're watching with us online and you're at home, go grab your, go grab your juice out of the refrigerator. Get back. Anybody else that we missed? Anybody else? Sorry, they turned the lights on here so I can't see a thing. Man, it's so good to see everybody. This is the first Sunday it's worth celebrating. Once a month we slow down and we remember those things that are, that are so important, those core values. Thank you for being here and as we begin to celebrate what is the most incredible covenant ever cut between God and humanity in the person of Jesus Christ. Is that it? Everybody good and loaded anybody fighting with their cup i need a jackhammer so that i can get into this little thing here all right so let's uh let's let's settle our hearts sorry settle our minds and let's let's live this when the bible says do this in remembrance of me he's inviting us to go in and remember this this moment in time and space afresh so let's let's remember this The Apostle Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus, for your body. Your body for ours. It says in the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you for the blood. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you for the greatest expression of love. Jesus Christ the greatest expression of love, the greatest expression of commitment and resolve. Thank you for giving your son for our salvation. We remember and we celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen. Man, God is good. God is so good. It's important for us to slow down and remember those things that are important to me. Jesus was an incredible gift, even as our babies are an incredible gift. 
You know, the world looks at children and goes, man, you know, and I know a lot of young parents are going, should I even have children in this day and age? Things are so messed up. Can I tell you, I said that, my parents said that, and my grandparents said the same thing. It's okay. God's grace is enough no matter what the generation, okay? Children are a blessing from the Lord. We dedicate children here. We don't do infant baptism. One, we don't want to drown them. Number two, we believe that it is a result of believing that you're baptized. But we also believe that the children are covered by the believing parents according to the word of God. So we offer the opportunity to dedicate your children. These are families coming together and saying, you know what? I'm going to dedicate my child to God at an early age. And I'm gonna commit to teach that child and raise that child in the way that they should go. If that's you and you have a child that you would like to dedicate, I'd love to call up the leaders and we will lay hands on you and pray for you because you're gonna need some help, amen? You're gonna need some help with those wonderful little blessings. All right, anybody wanna dedicate any children? I'm, I can't see, just raise your hand if you need to go. Oh, oh, we got one right here. All right, come up. If I get my leaders here to come, to come up, we can get a microphone. And if you need to go to the nursery and get a baby, be sure and take your coat ticket with you. All right. Introduce yourself. Grandpa, you want to hold that? And Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my daughter, Delilah. All right, <laughs> Delilah. Okay. Any more of my leaders? All right. We are going to, to pray. You're going to need some help, and you're going to need some wisdom. So we're going to dedicate Delilah right now. Y'all join us in prayer as we, we celebrate this. Father God, we lift up mom and baby right now in the name of Jesus. God, I'm asking you, Lord, to give mama wisdom that she is like she has never experienced, that she would be guided and directed by the power of your Holy Spirit according to your word, that she would raise Delilah in the way that she should walk and that she should live and that she should go as she offers her child, as she trusts her child to your ultimate sovereignty, I ask you, God, to give her rest and peace. And Father, I'm asking you to draw this baby to you at an early age. As she should know you and have a heart that runs hard after you to your glory. Bless this family, please. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's give him a hand. All right, it's incredible. Children again are a blessing. I want to, I want to, I want to say thank you to a special group of people. We are located. For those who are watching, may not know exactly where Rockfish Church is located. We're located just outside of what was formerly known as Fort Bragg, Fort Liberty, and uh, and and we are blessed to have a lot of military men and women here. So I'm going to ask for appreciation to be shown, and many of you are going to be clapping for yourselves. Because we're not just a church for military, we're a church of military. And without you doing what you do and being involved, it would be very difficult for us to do what we do. But I want to say thank you to our military, every branch. I want to say thank you to our first responders, whether they are our police department, our fire department, our medical um, emergency department. I just want to say thank you to all of them. Can we give them a hand just, just from our hearts? Very often, you embody something, whether you realize it or not, that is very beautiful and very spiritual. The sacrificial life is a life that is Christ-like in a lot of ways. And when you say, I'm going to put myself in harm's way, or I'm going to be there for people at some of the most difficult times in their lives, emergency situations or, or whatever, you, you have an opportunity to embody Christ in that situation. So I want to pray for you. That, that God would bless you and guide you and give you those moments, whether you're in the heat of battle, and this is a crazy world, but when you say, God, I want you to use me to bring value and, and preservation and safety into the lives of other people, it's a beautiful thing, and it is not contradictory. You can be a soldier and you can be a Christian, amen? You can be a policeman or a policewoman, and you can be a Christian, Amen. They are not antitheses. They are, they are beautiful, and it works better when we have God's moral and his spirit and his wisdom guiding us. Let's lift up our military and first responders. Father, I ask that you would draw them to you, not just the ones that are here, but those who are in serving capacities all across our state and all across our nation. 
Holy Spirit, the living God, I ask that you would birth a revival in their hearts, that they would be men and women of integrity, that you would give them success in, in their efforts to rescue and to help and to, to prevent harm, and, and those who are called to preserve freedom against the, the enemies of this nation and anybody who would stand against your sovereign will and goodness. Father, I ask that you would bless them and guide them. In Jesus' name, protect them and their families. Amen. And there's another group of volunteers. Yeah, our military is an all-volunteer. That's something that's beautiful. But there's another group of volunteers. It's those who are here at Rockfish serving every single week and on Easter. Man, thank you all so much for what you did. We had between, between six and 700 additional people over the course of those five services on Sunday. We had 45 people accept Jesus Christ and 13 people baptized. Amen? Come on, that's pretty good stuff. It, it, it's a testament to if you will teach the word of God, if you will preach the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God and the salvation, not some sil silver tongued orator or anybody else. It's just the truth. It's the spirit that speaks to the heart of humanity and brings help and brings hope. And people heard that on Easter thanks to so many volunteers. Every single person played a part. Thank you. If you're interested in being a volunteer at Rockfish Church, we have something called Starting Point. The reason we have Starting Point is the Word of God says to know those who labor among you. It's hard at a church this size. We're a small building with a lot of people, just so to kind of help you contextualize that. Um, and in essence, we have three different churches on Sunday. Each congregation is different, but we're trying to grow smaller as we grow larger, and part of that is really knowing those who labor among you. Starting point is so that you can know the leadership, you can know the vision, you can know the doctrine, you can know those things that you really need to know before you join arms or purchase that ticket on that ship and start jumping on that train. And we just want to be transparent. When it comes to leadership and doctrine and structure and outreach and all of those things, we want you to know what you're getting into. And it also is a prerequisite to volunteering. Let me tell you why. Because I care about your children. We care about being and keeping them safe. We do background checks on our volunteers. There is accountability. We live in a crazy world. And you may not be an ax murderer, but that doesn't mean the person next to you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Anyway, so if you're interested in being a member or part of Rockfish Church and what we're doing and getting involved in the ministry, please consider Starting Point. It's immediately following this service straight out the hall. You'll see big banners. You can, you can kind of register for that, and you're welcome to be a part of that. Uh, I want to talk to you about Rockfish Gatherings. We have so many military people coming and going. If you want to be a part of the gatherings, gatherings are people who leave Rockfish very often or they aren't in a position to drive to Rockfish, so they host a gathering, which is kind of an online community. It's not a substitute for the church, but very often you guys will leave, you'll go somewhere, you won't connect with the church immediately, but you still need to be connected, not only to a church and teaching, but to the mission. And we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes, but it's important, no matter what happens, the mission never changes. Gatherings are a way to help you continue to, continue to engage in the mission no matter where you go. Another one is my reach. On the back of your chair is a QR code. And if you don't have the Rockfish app, you can download it there. But my reach is an opportunity for you to, to personally and individually engage in reaching people for Jesus. My reach is you just click on it and you, you either share the gospel or you pray with somebody. Anyway, there's a plethora of different options that are higher and low level outreach opportunities. And once you've done that, you just click on and share. I prayed with someone today and you share that and it brings encouragement to the body and it shows us that we're being effective and we're not just being hearers of the word, but we're doing it. And it's an encouragement when I look down and go, we're almost at 3000 reaches. There's a lot of people here. We could do 3,000 reaches in two days if everybody just did this together until the Great Commission becomes a, 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 a real corporate obsession. It will remain unfulfilled, and that's what we hope to happen, every one of us doing what God's called us to do. Now, we're going to take up an offering. Let me help you with this. If you're not a member of Rockfish Church, if you're a member of another church and you're a guest with us today, give your money to your church, all right? Pay your tithes and offerings because they need help. Um, you know, and, and they need that commitment and we're not asking you to do that. But if this is your, your church and you feel like God's called you here, or you want to contribute, please feel free. A lot of different ways to give, but I'm going to pray over that offering in just a few minutes. And, and up on the screen, as we do that, are going to come a list of people who have decided to make Rockfish Church. They've completed starting point and make Rockfish Church their home over the course of the last 30 days. Okay. So if you're interested in that or, 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 or as those people come up, 
or we see those names, please give them a hand. And one more thing. As soon as we take up the offering, again, there's going to be a reach video that comes up, but we're doing something special. We are about to launch what we, what we refer to as the Rockfish Church Chaplaincy Program. Okay? Rockfish Church Chaplaincy Program. We want to unleash on our community and the surrounding area qualified men and women who would love to see couples who do it, who go into our hospitals, who go into our rest homes, who go into our prisons, who go into our schools, who go into our businesses and commit to bring value into the lives with the giftings that God has placed inside of every single one of you. We're going to have a training. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a two, uh, two weekend course. It's going to be a, it's going to be an eight hour course, which will be certificated, but we and then after that will be a, a probationary period or an OJT. So we want to equip and then release uh, some, some anointed and equipped people on our community. If you are interested, just go to the Rockfish Church app, upcoming events, and you can register for that. It's free. There's no cost. It's just we exist to make, equip, and release fully committed followers of Jesus. That's you. I want to equip you to do so like never before. So pray about that, think about that, and then click on and sign up for that upcoming event. It's going to be, it's not going to happen till May, so you're going to have a little bit of time. But please consider being a part of what we hope will be an incredible outreach. You all ready to pray so I can be quiet? Amen. Yeah. All right. Lord, thank you so much for the abundance that you've given us that we may not even recognize at times. Father, use this for your glory. Receive from our hearts. For your glory, give us the wisdom to, to be the best stewards that we can possibly be. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We got one more thing here. <laughs> yeah, I was as tired of talking as you are listening, but this is important. Listen, this is important. Today, this weekend, marks one year for Rockfish Church Philippines. <laughs> Amen. Come on. <laughs> Woo. Guys. I want to say thank you to all of you who have supported Rockfish Church Philippines and prayed. God is doing some amazing things. We have seen new believers. We've seen baptisms. We've seen outreach like crazy going on over there. Pastor Jeff and Tanya have, have done some wonderful things. And I don't want to miss this opportunity to, to say thank you to everybody and thank you to Jesus for something beautiful. Amen? All right, here we go. We're back for another reach update this update is going to be a little a little different than what our normal reach updates are i want to talk to you for just a moment about what it means and how we can actually reach effectively now you know if there's anything that you're going to do and you're going to do it well and you're going to reach goals and accomplish things it's going to it's going to take a little something extra. That something extra we often refer to as grit. Many of you have heard the terminology grit. I believe that God has called us to reach in 2024 in an unprecedented way. I believe that he has, and I'll, I'll be able to share a lot of this later, but he has opened some incredible doors, be it in the Philippines, be it, be it locally, be it in the area of media. And in order for us to really step into everything that God's called us to do, I believe it's gonna take, I wanna use a little different word than grit. I believe it's going to take perseverance. I want us to begin even now to develop a mindset of perseverance. You know, sometimes you do the heavy lifting on the front end, you do the plowing for a field, but it, it creates deep furrows that you can, that you can plant seeds in and, and harvest a bountiful crop. So as we begin to reach in 2024, I want us to just kind of set our minds and set our heart, hearts uh, according to what I believe is God's word for us for this hour, perseverance. So I want to encourage you to persevere in a good thing. 
wherever you're involved. If you're not involved in REACH, I want to invite you, please, get involved with REACH. You say, what is REACH? REACH is reaching the world with the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And there's so many unique ways that we're doing it here at Rockfish Church. And you say, well, I don't go to Rockfish Church. Get involved somewhere and get involved with the Great Commission. We can make a difference. Christ has called us to reach the world with the gospel. And I want to encourage you, reach with perseverance this year. I think we've got an update from the Philippines from Pastor Jeff. So again, thank you and God bless you. Hey everyone, Pastor Jeff here with your REACH update from Rockfish Church, Philippines. This past month has been an exciting month. Uh, we started our Wednesday night foundations class and that has been awesome. We've been learning about how we can trust the Bible, how we can understand the Bible, and then how we can share our faith. Those are just the first few topics that we covered, but the response has been wonderful. We continue doing our local outreaches, not just here in Mangahan, but we did one uh, for what they call Ali Lakad. It's a, a pilgrimage of sorts when thousands, I, w I would say tens of thousands of people are walking the streets, making their way from Pasig outside of Manila all the way to Antipolo on a trek there to the Catholic Church. And so we set up alongside Ortigas Avenue and we shared the love of Jesus in very practical ways. We brought our worship team out there. We gave away um, some Lugao, some Champarado, add a little bit of chocolate and, um, and water, something very practical, but just a way to share the love of Jesus in a very practical way. Besides that, on Easter Sunday in the afternoon, we joined with the other churches in the community also to share the love of Jesus and show there's unity within the body of Christ. So that was a wonderful time. Um, we are ramping up our digital efforts and I am so proud of our creative team. And I got to brag for a second. We just reached 1 million views on our one of our very first reels. And so I give them so much credit. And so that is your REACH update for this month. God bless you. Continue praying for us as we continue praying for you. You want to know what's brewing at Rockfish Church? Well, stay tuned. It's coming right up. You may have noticed these signs in the foyer of every Rockfish Church site. These signs are filled with the names of folks who have decided to become fully committed followers of Jesus as a result of the ministry of Rockfish Church. If Rockfish Church has touched you and you have made a decision for Christ as a result of this ministry, please take the time to sign your name on the board and celebrate with so many other people the good things that God has done. Discover Starting Point at Rockfish Church, a concise four-session series held every Sunday at 12.10 p.m. This introductory class reveals the church's mission, values, beliefs, and opportunities for engagement, ideal for anyone new to Rockfish or seeking a deeper connection. Embark on a journey of spiritual growth and fellowship this Sunday. Childcare is provided, and you are welcome to start anytime. That is it for this week, but I want you to stay tuned because there is more coming. We'll see you again later. Hello, Rockfish Church. Hello, Rockfish Kids. <laughs> hey, guys, if this is your first time to Rockfish Church, welcome. You will need a sticker to get into our Rockfish Kids ministry. The reason why is because we love our kids so much. We want to make sure that they're safe and secure while we teach them about Jesus Christ. So if you weren't able to print out a sticker, it's because you need to register your kids if you um, need to do that. Go out through the double doors to the kids ministry kiosk. Register your kids, and then you will be able to print out a sticker for all future services. When you get your sticker, just like mine, make sure it's placed nice and high. That way our lifeguards can see them. And also, if your child's code comes up behind me on the screen, it's because your child needs you. All classes are open. Nursery to fifth grade, you are released to your classrooms. Um, parents, please don't forget to get your kids right after service. Let's continue to worship, and God bless.
us continue to worship. to fear anything. Thank you that we can always come to you when we think we are afraid and know that you will come and rescue us. Thank you, Jesus. We glorify, honor, and magnify you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Hello and welcome to Rockfish Church. Thank you so much for being here, whether you're, you're live here in, at the church or you're joining us online uh, on one of our online platforms or in one of our Rockfish Church gatherings. Thank you so much for being here. I want to bring you up to speed. We are about to start today, and we've actually not done this before to my knowledge, part three of a sermon series entitled Armed and Dangerous. In the first four weeks, we did a series entitled Anth- Answering the Atheist. And not only was it to answer atheist accusations outside, but to answer those questions that very often we have on the inside that we haven't answered or churches haven't answered thoroughly. We want you to have the answers to the questions. The Bible says that we should have a reason for why we believe what we believe. And in order to do that, well, you need, you need the information. Part two of that was called dealing with deception. We were looking at why doctrine is important, um, why it is what it is within the context of the church, how that doctrine actually affects our lives in a lot of different ways, how it also influences our worldview. And, and, and very often is, and is something that is very, is, is contrastive when it comes to how the world sees things things and how the church sees things. And, and why do we see things how we do? A lot of that entails doctrine. We're moving into part three of the sermon series, which I'm really excited about is it's entitled empowered to prevail. So over the course of the next four weeks, we're going to be looking at what, what provision has God made for the church? In other words, if he expects us to to carry out the Great Commission, and and I want you to understand why this is important. The Great Commission is something that has to go forward regardless. Whether there's a riot or whether there's a bomb or whether there's an earthquake or a natural calamity or a, a, a catastrophe, it doesn't matter. The mission never changes. We need to be prepared and empowered to do what God has called us to do regardless of the circumstances. If, if, all of them, if the economy crashed tomorrow and things changed dramatically in our culture tomorrow, it doesn't change our mission. It doesn't change what God has called us to do individually or corporately. It may affect how we do it, but it doesn't and shouldn't affect what we do. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit today, and there's a lot in here, but this particular message is foundational to where we're going if you missed any part of this series, I would encourage you, please go online, check it out on YouTube or, some, or Facebook or some of the other platforms that we have. But today, we're going to talk about a big mission and a big provision. You know, God has a big mission for his church, and this big mission requires certain things. Any big mission requires careful planning. It requires intentional and good communication. It requires clear objectives. I tell people very often, we don't just have a vision to reach the world. We have a plan on how to reach the world. And very often that's missing. If you have a vision without a plan, it's really just a dream. A plan makes all the difference, but you need clear objectives in order to have solid plans. We need adequate provision and precise execution. So There's a particular verse in the Bible that says, no person enlisted in the military concerns himself with the affairs of everyday life. So that's kind of what we're looking at. We're going, uh, you know, on that context to where God has given us things to help us do what we've called to do. And we don't need to be distracted by certain other things. Anyway, God knew all of what I just told you. The unfolding of Christ, which is his his big plan began as soon as Adam sinned. He wasn't surprised. He was prepared. And that's what we want to be as well. So let's look at three missional keys to success that God put in place for the church. Number one, and, and I'm sorry to jump into this so abruptly, but we've got, I've got a lot of information and content that I want to share with you. But three keys to success. One is a common call. Unity is key to the success of any team. In fact, here, when you finish starting point, the number one thing that we ask you to do, the number one thing we ask you to commit to is the preservation of the unity of the body of Christ. How do we do that? Forgiveness is the functional preservation of unity. Did you you hear what I just said? Forgiveness is functional preservation of unity. To, To offer and ask for forgiveness and to extend forgiveness when asked. That's how we functionally preserve unity. Because there's a lot of different issues that can arrive when you're dealing with a lot of different people. Christ launches the mission of the church with the unity and clarity of a common call. 
Incredibly important. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. In fact, this is one of the founding reference scriptures upon which Rock Fish and I believe every church is, is founded. It says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Some interesting things about this. This tells us that this particular unifying call of the church, and you hear me say it this way all the time, until the Great Commission becomes a corporate conviction, it will remain unfulfilled. But anyway, the call is ongoing, and that's in, it's incredibly important. It wasn't something that he entrusted to uh, a group and said, okay, it's just for you, but it's not. It's the common call. It's the ongoing call of the Capital C Church, which... Is my second point. It's church wide. That means that every single person in here has an obligation and a responsibility scripture to do their part in fulfilling this great commission. It is not for us alone. It is for you as an individual, for me as an individual. I would ask you, what are you doing right now? What is reflecting your allegiance to Christ and his call right now? Or how are you making, equipping, and releasing disciples for Christ? If you're not, you're, you're abdicating a responsibility that each one of us, according to the word, will give an account for. It says in the Bible, Jesus gives us in a parable, he says, to everybody was given talents. And the question will come one day, what did you do with those talents? Let me tell you what fruit in the kingdom of God is, is life transformation and change because of you and your influence. That's important for us to remember. So the call is ongoing, it's church-wide, and it's primary. This is not the secondary or tertiary thing in our life that we say, okay, well, church is so optional that I go to church on Sunday and that is the expression of me answering the call. That's, you're not even close. You're still in the locker room. You probably haven't even shown up in the gym for training at that point. I'm not saying this to condemn. I'm just telling you, primarily, he gave the disciples, gave us the command, go and make disciples. What are you doing if you are not doing it, you are not in complete obedience to Christ. I'm, I'm not saying this to be ugly. I'm saying this because it is true. It is the word of God. You can't just put that on me. And, and as, as popular in America, you can't just put that us, on us and assume somebody else in this room is doing it. Primary, and, and this fourth part is, I'm gonna be honest, it's big. In fact, when I look at the vision that we corporately have here at Rockfish to reach people, it's bigger than what I know we can do on our own. Our hope and our desire is to have a plant or a partner in every state in America and every nation on the face of the earth. Guys, that's a big call, but our God is a bigger God. So we need a real plan and we need real resources and real ability. This is again, an ongoing call, a church-wide call, a primary and a big Call. Second key to success. First, common call. Second is clear expectations. Um, you know, to launch a successful mission without clear expectations, you're setting people up for failure. So he made it very, very clear to the, to the first followers, the disciples of Jesus Christ, what he wanted to, them to do, when he wanted them to do it, and how he wanted them to do it. In fact, I want to Take a look at the clear steps, so the clear next steps that he gave the apostles for preparation for the mission. Acts 1, 4 through 8 says this. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, now this was after the resurrection, before his ascension to heaven, and this is incredibly important. While he was eating with them, he gave them the, this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of, that my father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates. The Father has set them in his own authority. That's why, I'll be honest with you, I don't spend a whole lot of time looking at the times or the dates concerning the return of Christ. I acknowledge that it's closed. I anticipate it like it's every single day. He told us to eagerly look for his coming. But I don't, I don't sit around and extrapolate on when that's going to happen. I think we need to be too busy doing what we need to do to get too sidetracked or too far into the weeds on something he says you can't know. 
uh, you know, again, and you're welcome to study all of the eschatology that you want. As long as you're living according to what you do know, you can study and spend all the times on those things that you can't know. I'm fine with that. Um, so Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom? And he said, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the father has set in his own authority. But you will receive, and this is important, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. He was saying, he was bringing them back to the mission. He was bringing them back to what was at hand. Stop worrying about that. Focus on this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be, as a result of this power, my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Very important. Told them exactly what to do. He said, don't leave Jerusalem. Clear expectation. He said, wait for the gift my father promised. Clear expectation. You will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in all of the earth. This was incredibly important to Jesus. This was absolutely primary. And this is, we're going to be looking at a lot of this over the course of the next four weeks. What happened there, but not just staying there. What are their implications for them? What was the result of this experientially? And what will be the result of us or what should be the expectation of us in this area? So the next key to success, the common call, clear expectations, and a constant companion. See, Jesus knew that this mission would require resources. Every good mission is going to require adequate and good, reasonable resources. Jesus understood how important the power of the Holy Spirit was to this mission. You cannot fulfill the mission without the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. You can't. It was never intended to happen that way. He, 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 he forbid them, forbade them rather, from going out and trying until they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. That's important because there's a, there's a reason. John 16 and 7 says some things that, could, that should cause us to ask some very deliberate questions. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Hang on, hang on, hang on. This was after the resurrection. Consider this. This was after the resurrection and Jesus is there with them bodily. He's in fact in what we refer to as his glorified body. And we know for 40 days after the resurrection, he inter interacted with people and personally encountered over 500 people. This is documented. So it wasn't just that they didn't find a body. The body they were looking for was walking around for 40 days after the resurrection. This is historical. This is something that's held in time and space that your opinion doesn't matter about. These were eyewitnesses, and they had this conversation after the resurrection. Now, how do we know it's true? Well, it, it even gets better. It even gets better. He said, he said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I, go, if I do not go away, the helper. No, no. Who, who, who is this helper? will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him. Who is this helper and how important is this helper? How preeminent is this helper in the life of the believer that it would be more advantageous that Jesus not be here teaching today and the Holy Spirit be here instead? Because that's what he was saying. Think about that. This is a question that we need to answer. Consider the gravity of what he's saying. It is better for them, it's better for us that he not be here and that the Spirit come. And I think it's something that we need to consider. The Father to the Son, the Son to the follower. All of this works because of the presence of that third person, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came upon the Son at, the, at the, the, the power or the request of the Father as he walked in obedience to the Father and empowered the Son to do what he did. Remember, the Holy Spirit came upon him and drove him into the wilderness and returned in the power of the Spirit. What happened? Well, Christ is saying that what happened to me is necessary for you. It's so necessary that I'm leaving so that I don't inhibit this process. Let that sink in for just a moment and you'll see the relevance. Any big mission requires a big provision. So who, whom, who is this Holy Spirit? This is what we're going to spend the next four weeks answering. We'll answer this question and, and today is a kind of a generalized launching point that we need to settle some things concerning who the Holy Spirit is right now. But I want to share something with you that's kind of personal. 
when I first came to Christ, um, I, I kind of grew up in church and I knew the, I knew a lot about the word of God, but something happened when I committed my life and surrendered it completely and said, okay, God, I tell you what, I'm going to give myself to you. I'm yours hat, shoes, and pocketbook, as my old man used to say. But I'm going to give all of that I am to you. And I was baptized, and, and some crazy stuff happened. And, and I was like, you know, God, I really want to know your voice. Because when I was born again, the word was different for some reason. Suddenly, when I began to read the Logos, then it began to speak to me in powerful ways. And an element of my understanding was like it had never been. And the heart the desire that I had was to know the voice of God. Maybe you've never considered it, but it was something that I just felt, I felt like, man, so many people all through the Bible have heard the voice of God. Abraham and Moses and, and everybody, even Jesus was constantly hearing and responding to the voice of God. And I thought as a believer, how can I really be like Christ if I can't hear clearly and discern clearly the voice of the Holy Spirit? Is this something that God wants for me? Is this something that God desires? And I remember praying, I would go out in my town at night and I would pray, God, please teach me to hear your voice because I'll be honest, I really couldn't. If I did at the time, I didn't really recognize it, but my, my heart burned because I thought I can never fully obey him if I can't accurately hear him. And as the Bible says, there's a lot of different voices out there. There's my inside voice, which is very seldom right. Maybe your inside voice points you in the right direction, but very often my inside voice needs a stern rebuke. But anyway, it was important to me. And over the course of the last 30 years, He's taught me that, to hear his voice in ways that I never thought and never expected, but are absolutely crucial. But I want to, I want to say to you, please, avoid a massive mistake, and you need to decide today, because if you make this mistake, you're not going to get the rest of this series. The mistake people often make is that they assume the experiences they have to this point concerning God are all of the experiences that they are that there are. You, you understand that's that's not necessarily true. I've had experiences with God that have that have that have progressed and are very different and have changed my life dramatically over time. But very often there's things that we may not understand or may not be clear to us or maybe we were taught something different and we've said my experience is all there is. I'm going to tell you, please be careful when you say all that I know about the Bible, it's all I've experienced for the last 20 years of my Christian walk and that's all there is. Maybe, but maybe not. Because there were some very godly people in the word of God who spent a lot of time following God, but one day something happened that had never happened. Can I tell you the day of Pentecost had never happened? But because that experience never was before, it didn't mean it wouldn't be again. And it happened. You know, there was, Moses never had the, the burning bush experience and the voice of God like he heard that day. Will you consider just humbly, perhaps, maybe everything that you've experienced with God isn't all that there is? Very often we allow our dogma or our doctrine to limit us and we never experience. I mean, let's just look at it on a, on a practical level. Many of us have not jumped out of an airplane. Does that mean that we can't or we won't? Only if you're wise. Sorry, guys, if that's your job, I get it. Anyway... I want us to guard against spiritual lethargy. And the point is that this is not true in life experience. It's not true in knowledge. And we shouldn't assume that it's true concerning our spiritual walk with God. There's always room to grow and experience a very multifaceted God. I never assume all I know is all there is. If I did, it would be to my spiritual detriment and my growth and maturity. All right. Um, make sense? So let's look at who the Holy Spirit is by beginning with who the Holy Spirit is not. All right? The Holy Spirit is not flaky. And when I say flaky, some of you know what I'm talking about and some of you don't. Let me introduce you to the terminology. I can say kooky. I can say flaky. Let me say it this way. John 16, 13a says, but 
when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Can I tell you what truth is not? Truth is not flaky. And his goal is to drive us into or draw us or lead us into all truth. Truth is that which is consistent with reality. The Holy Spirit is not flaky. He never contradicts his word. He never teaches against, he actually teaches against creating a flaky atmosphere in the church. Really? Because very often people in the name of the Holy Spirit create an atmosphere inconducive for unbelievers to even experience what God is trying to do. Can I give you an example? The word of God says this. It says, if the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're out of your mind and you're flaky? Yes. But very often in church cultures, we adopt spiritual things that are counterintuitive and cause the Holy Spirit to look flaky when he's instructing us not to look flaky. I'm not trying to shackle the Holy, Holy Spirit, but the, the Bible says that the, pro, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet's. It gives instructions on speaking in tongues and the appropriateness of it. And, the interp- and we're going to look at this extensively over the course of the next few years. You're going to see what the Bible says. And I really want you to please, don't just take my word for these things. Look at the word of God. Because very often our doctrine and our experiences may not be consistent with the word of God. I feel like it's important. Because I'm going to be honest with you. If If the Holy Spirit is not present and powerful in the church, what makes it different than anything else? What makes it different from other religions that that have great theory or philosophy or, or whatever? If everything about God is a theological, doctrinal perspective and it's not in functional power, what is the difference? All throughout history, the difference was that God came in and made what we thought were God's subjective to his real power in real time. Think about the plagues in Egypt. What happened? They worshiped the sun. He exhibited his power over their so-called gods. He darkened the sun. They worshiped the Nile. He come in and he experientially showed. The apostle Paul said the kingdom of God is not word only, but power. And very often we relegate God and his ability in our lives to nothing more than words. What if the apostles would have done that? What if that would have been true in the life of Jesus Christ himself? I'm just throwing out some things for you to consider. If, again, the Holy Spirit leads us into truth, he is not flaky. The Holy Spirit is not flashy. The second part of that scripture that I just, or or Galatians 5, 17 through 25 says this. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit is, is what is contrary to the flesh. Understand, they do not say the same things. This is key to learning the voice of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never, never co-signs with your flesh. Did, Did you hear that? According to the word of God, the flesh and the spirit are always at odds because they want you to obey them. Your flesh wants to do what you want to do. The Holy Spirit wants to do what it wants to do. I've had people come and tell me that the Holy Spirit is telling them to do something that is fleshly and not according to the word of God. That is not, it is not the spirit of God. It is not fleshly. I don't know about you guys, but very often my flesh speaks very loud. And again, it isn't something to be followed. It's something to be repressed through the power of the spirit. That's according to the word of God. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not able to do whatever you really want. The real you wants to do. But if you are led by the spirit, if you just obey him, recognize him and follow him, you are not under the law or the penalties associated with it. The Holy Spirit is not flashy. He's not fleshy. The Holy Spirit is not telling you to leave your wife and run off with somebody else. That is your flesh or Satan. He said, don't call her a Satan, whatever. I'm just... (laughs) Uh, guilty, guilty last. No, I'm kidding. Kind of. Right, just moving right along. The Holy Spirit is not fleshly or flaky, fleshly. How about this one? Flashy. Right, this is huge. This is huge. And I, I, this is important to me. Guys, I want revival and I want the power of God in our churches because we need it to do the mission like never before. But I'm just going to tell you, it's not about us. I want the real thing. I'm not looking for some flash. I'm looking for the real presence of God in his people. 
evidenced by the fruit of God guiding everything that they do, the fruit of the Spirit. John 16b says this, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. The Holy Spirit himself doesn't draw attention to him. What makes you think he's going to lead you in a way that you draw attention to yourself? And I have seen, and I'm not saying this to condemn anybody. I'm not saying this to cast dispersions upon anybody or any ministry, but I've seen a lot of preachers get up and make a lot of what they did and said uh, about them. Can I tell you any gift that you ever see demonstrated on this, on this, whatever this, up here or in there is about who he is, not who we are. Does that make sense? Your gifts are not to promote you. The power of the spirit is not to promote you. It's to help others and glorify God. And when we make it flashy to make it about us, when your gift demands that you be seen by other people, you got a heart that needs to be changed. I'm not trying to say that to be ugly, but I know people who want to prophesy and they want the gifts so they can make it about them. Your gifts are not a platform for self-promotion. Did you hear that? The gifts of God are not a platform to promote me or to promote this ministry or for anybody else to do the same. The gift of the spirit are for the good of the body or for the building up of the body, not distracting the body. The Holy Spirit himself doesn't do it. For us to think we should do that is incredibly erroneous. And you understand why I'm teaching these things now is to prepare us for where we're going. He sets the example in this. The Holy Spirit is, this is huge. Holy Spirit is essential. His presence and his power is essential. John 14, 26 says this, but the helper, the comforter, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said. Think about that. You were never, we need help. We were never designed to do this independently. It's not because of your incredible memory or your incredible spiritual prowess. It's because the Holy Spirit whispering in your ear brings you true wisdom, knowledge, and understanding and a power and a provision that is beyond your ability. One that you didn't earn, one that he gracefully gave. That's what grace is. Grace is an ability that you got that you didn't deserve. That's what all the grace gifts are. It's more about him than it is about us. But if you don't realize, if we don't realize that without the presence and power of God in our lives, the kingdom of God is not mere word, but the kingdom of God is not word, but power. Power that validates this word. He said, these signs shall follow those who believe Jesus, the apostles. It's something that is consistent throughout church history up to 400 years after the apostles. We'll talk about that a little bit later as we deal with some, some accusations of cessationism and some other things that you really need to understand. Who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is essential. The Holy Spirit is powerful. Acts 1 and 8 says, but you will receive power. The word power in the orig original language, there's a word called dunamis. It's where we get the word dynamite from. doesn't mean a little bit of power. It means a lot of power. He said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? <laughs> And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and into the ends of the world. We'll discuss the difference between the Spirit coming to you, coming in you, and coming upon you at a later point. But those are all functions of the Holy Spirit that are distinct and different and necessary. It's the same Holy Spirit. But what does he come to accomplish and how does he come to do it? He is a he, by the way. The Holy Spirit is not an it. That's not what we're talking about necessarily when I say personal. When we talk about the Holy Spirit is personal. This is, you need to catch this point and it will, it will drive home the whole relevance of why we're talking about this, okay? But the Holy Spirit is personal. He is a person, not an it. You can hurt his feelings. You can grieve him. This is important. He is a person, but that's not what we're talking about. 1 Corinthians 2.13 says, this is what we speak, not in word taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit. So we learn that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. You can't do that without the Spirit. Explaining spiritual realities with spiritual, with Spirit-taught words. I can get up here and talk to you till I'm blue in the face. 
And these paddles on the side of your head are incapable of hearing the spirit. But our words, according to the word, are our spirit. Jesus said, my words are spirit and my words are life. Uh, we'll, we'll get into this and we'll look at this deeper probably on a Wednesday night. But are our words spirit? Now think about it. I don't know anybody in here till you open your mouth. Then what you are comes out in this natural world. Anyway, Acts 16, 6 through 12 says this. And I want you to listen to this very carefully. It says, Paul and his companions traveled through the region of Pygia and Galatia, having been kept by the Spirit from preaching the word in the providence of Asia. The Spirit of God kept them, stopped them, prohibited them from speaking the word of God in Asia. That's what it just said. That's the second point. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, Bith, uh, I'm slaughtering these words, Bithynia, Bithynia, but the spirit of Jesus would not allow them. So they, they said, we can't go to Asia. All right, spirit said no. So we're, hey, we're going this way. Look, there's that. Let's go there. Spirit said no. Wouldn't let them do it, right? How about this one? But the spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him. Hey, come to Macedonia and help us, please. After Paul had seen this vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So I'm going to ask you a question. Is any of this something that could have come to, a conclusion that they could have come to with any amount of knowledge of the Bible in its current context? Now, you need to, you need to understand what I'm saying. Everything that just, because we're going to talk about a, a, a terminology called the sufficiency of the word that backs up cessationism. People say, well, you got the word, so you don't need the power of the spirit. Let me explain something. You could read this word. He could have read every aspect. It could have been cooked completely. We could have had, you said, we didn't have the whole Bible. You could have the whole Bible. It'll never, never tell you whether to take the job at Walmart or Lowe's. Correct? Do you concur? Is that true? You can understand the entirety of this word in context, and it, will, it would have never given them that information. Am I correct in saying that? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Did they need the direction, the personal direction of the Holy Spirit? They did. They got it. And God wants you to have it. He never told them, it will never tell you rather to go to per Pergama or Galatia, but it will tell you how to behave when you get there and what to do when you arrive. Do you understand? The Spirit will never tell you anything that is, con we're gonna look at this in just a moment. The Spirit will never tell you anything that is contrary to the word of God. But let me tell you, if you are going to follow God, if you're gonna do the word, you need the Holy Spirit on how and when and where to do it if you're gonna do it effectively. That is the word of God. And that's just one little snippet that I pulled out as we see in the book of Acts over and over and over how when they accepted God's mission, God's provision was available and he directed them. They needed to hear it. They didn't know where to go, but they knew what, where not to go. So we understand the Spirit was communicating with them somehow. And then he spoke to them in a vision that was clear and told them where to go. That, that's prophetic in nature. That could be called a vision or a prophetic uh, vision or dream. So God spoke to them that way because it was necessary. Well, people say, well, we don't need that. And I'm, I'm not going to get too deep into the woods on that. Here's my point. We have access to and we need that type of personal presence in our lives. Do you understand? We need that. I have real problems. I have real issues that I need real help from God on specifically, not generally. The Holy Spirit is essential. He's powerful. He's personal. And this is huge. This is probably one of the biggest. He is present. He is always with the believer. Now, this will really just kind of flip your world upside down to think that God is not off in heaven somewhere doing his thing, but he's an ever-present help in time of need, that he is here to answer those questions. Maybe the problem is that he's not, it's not that he's not speaking, it's just we're so far. See, when a man and a woman love each other and they want to share something intimate, they don't increase the volume they change the proximity. 
See, when my wife wants to tell me something that's between her and me, I put my ear really close to her mouth. She doesn't yell. She doesn't scream. I do that because I, I don't want, I'm, not, I'm trying not to listen. I want to hear. I want to focus. I believe that's what God desires for his church. I believe that he wants us to draw near to him so that he will draw near to us. Do you see God, even when you pray, as, as someone who is up in heaven and you're doing some kind of crapshoot hoping that he hears my prayers? And the Bible even says, say not who will come and go to heaven and bring God down or, or who will go to hell and bring him up. It says the word of faith is nigh you, even in your mouth. What he's saying is the power of the spirit of God is present in the life of the believer. He's an ever-present help in time of need. He can't comfort me. He can't teach me if I can't hear him. He can't lead me. If I don't have him and I don't let him. Guys, you and I, let's, let's just break it down, and the world needs the power and the provision of the Holy Spirit in our lives. How will they hear unless we go? How will we know where to go unless the Spirit of God is directing us? He is essential, he's powerful, he's personal, and he's present. Stand, please, if you're able, we'll get out of here. His presence is consistently producing fruit in the life of the true child of God. Any good that you do is because of his presence on the inside of you. The fruit of the spirit, all the good things in our lives comes from his presence in our lives. And we, we, we always talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And those should be the things that lead to maturity. Those should be all of the things. You know, on, on, on the robe of the priest, there was a bale and there's a pomegranate. And if the bales would not have had the pomegranate, the bales would have beat each other to death. But the prom, pomegranate was the fruit of the Spirit. The bales are the gifts of the Spirit. They work together. We're tempered internally through the power of the Holy Spirit and we're we're empowered externally through the power of the Holy Spirit. The church is in a weakened, I'm just going to say it, in an unbelieving, weak, emaciated state. He said, these signs will follow those who believe. He said, well, I don't see these signs. Yeah. We can blame it on God or we can humble ourselves and pray and take responsibility. Either God is not who he has said he is, or we're simply not doing what he tells us to do and trusting and believing him. The Holy Spirit of the living God is essential to, to the believer. If you do not have the spirit of God, don't fool yourself. You are not a child of God. He comes to us to save. He comes to us to save as we hear the gospel gospel of Jesus Christ. God so loved the world. You know, last week we heard, we saw where people heard the gospel. Their lives were changed. Their hearts were open as the Holy Spirit came to them. They yielded and they were baptized and now the Holy Spirit lives on the inside of them. Guys, let's over the course of the next four weeks, can we just kind of, can we just kind of set the lion of the tribe of Judah loose in his church? Can, can we conform ourselves to his word instead of trying to confirm his word to our experiences? I'm asking you, please. Some of you need the power of God to break addictions, to overcome bad circumstances, to be engaged in the mission to reach other people effectively. We've been failing in so many areas because I'm going to tell you, we try to do it without God and then offer our our cane like offering to God and demand he accept it. Let's do it his way. Let's just do it his way. If you're here and you don't know Christ today, you can. It says if you will call out with all your heart on the name of the Lord, he will hear you. If you will repent and be baptized, he will fill you with the power of his spirit and he gives gifts to those whom are his. Father, I thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your power, your presence. God, be with us. 
God, forgive us for relegating you, the almighty God of the universe, to a doctrine or to a philosophy or to an experience. God, I'm asking you to be who you desire to be among your people. That the world would look and would fear and would love you who are admirable and lovely. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you Wednesday night or in Starting Point.